Folks, if I could get you to take your seats, uh, please. We're going we're gonna, to uh, start at 8 o'clock sharp. I'd like to congratulate all of you for making it to New Orleans and not uh, just uh, booking your flights automatically to uh, San Francisco. So you passed the first, um, <laughs> the first step. Um, and I uh, welcome you this morning to uh, the session uh, for the resilience and vulnerability of Arctic and boreal ecosystems to climate change. Um, this is uh, convened by Abhishek and myself and Natalie Bowman and Michelle Mack. And we'll be taking turns throughout the day uh, uh, standing up here and moving people around. Um, our first speaker is Roshin Koman, um, an invited speaker. And um, her talk is on understanding drivers um, of regional scale carbon release from tundra ecosystems. And we need to put this up on the screen. Great, well thank you all for getting up so early in the morning and arriving in. I thought there would be three people here, so thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about the regional scale carbon fluxes from tundra ecosystems and the two pictures I have up here on the left, and I said I'd use the mouse, on the left we have what the tundra looks like with a lot of snow on it. On the right we have what it looks like in the summer. And a lot of the research has been done in the summer because it's a lot easier to make measurements over an area that is not snow covered. But the winter is very important for the annual budget and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So global temperatures have been increasing. Um, this, the graph on the top left is the temperature anomaly from uh, January of 2016. So you can see that the Arctic is much, much warmer than everywhere else. So even though we're have, seeing a lot of temperature increases, it's not uniform. A lot of the temperature increase is concentrated in the Arctic, where the temperatures are rising at about twice the rate of the global average. Um, the reason that matters in the Arctic is a lot of the soils in the Arctic are very rich in carbon. They're permafrost, they've been frozen for millennia. And the amount of carbon locked up in those soils is enough to double the atmospheric concentration of CO2 if it was all to be released. We don't expect it to be, happen anytime soon, but it's the potential for that means that we really want to understand what is driving any sort of temperature change there. So this is the uh, soil temperature profile from the Tulik borehole um, that Vladimir Romanovsky runs at UAF. And you can see that there's a number of different things going on here. If I have a mouse that works. Uh, go back. No, apparently not showing up. Um, so, yeah, I'll use the pointer. So the temperature, we're looking at, a, so you can see here that a lot of the temperatures, the shallower temperatures, are not getting as cold anymore. While they are warming up rapidly in the spring, in the winter time, they're not anything like as cold as they used to be. And the deeper soil temperatures are slowly beginning to warm. So we have different rates of warming at different depths. But you can see that not alone are the temperatures increasing, but the time it takes for the soils to freeze coming into winter has been extended for quite a long time. So some sites in the Arctic, it now takes two or three months for the soils to completely freeze. And this is called the zero curtain. So it's the time period when all the temperatures in the active layer come to around zero, everything equilibrates, and then you end up with a very sharp, everything freezes into a hard freeze in the deep winter. And that time period is quite important, and I'll come back to that later. And our understanding of that is also very important for the annual budget. So I've been working a lot on airborne CO2 data, and the idea was we wanted to use the airborne data to properly understand what are we seeing with the carbon fluxes in the Arctic. So there's a lot of people involved in this, and I want to thank the few of them that made it here. Um, but what we're trying to do is take the airborne data, eddy flux data, tall tower data, remote sensing and met drivers, and combine all of that together to get a nice overview of how, what are the carbon fluxes, what are the CO2 fluxes, in Alaska for the time periods we have this data. And what we found was the fall period, so when the zero curtain is as we go into winter, was pretty much driving the entire budget. So for the uh, tundra ecosystems, the winter respiration is key to our understanding of what's going on. 
So an example of this is on the left here we have the vegetation and you can see that there's boreal ecosystems in Alaska. We also have subarctic tundra in the bottom left in the southwest and we have arctic tundra up on the north slope. So the carbon fluxes you get from each of those type of ecosystems is a bit different. Um, on the right we have the net CO2 flux for, I randomly picked 10 days at the start of 2013. And you can see that in June 2013, the boreal ecosystems have woken up. They're taking up CO2. But the tundra ecosystems, they haven't quite woken up yet. They're respiring CO2, but the vegetation is not taking up enough CO2 to overcome that. And we see this quite often where the different ecosystems wake up at different times. So the annual budget they have for carbon uptake is different. We've also looked at, oh, wrong way, there we are. Um, we've also looked at some methane data, and Donna and Walter here, and Scott Miller is here, and they've led different studies looking at different aspects of the methane budget as we understand it. So Donna's paper looked at eddy flux data to see, do we understand the annual budget? And she found that about 50% of the methane comes out in the times we thought everything was dead. It's all of winter. So we're looking at that over that time period. The winter time really matters for the annual methane budget in the Arctic. Scott did a study looking at the entire state of Alaska and looked at the growing season when we have pretty good flight data and found a different behavior for uh, different areas. So on the left here we have the surface water, taken from Donna's paper, um, which just gives you an idea of how wet some parts of Alaska can be. So on the bottom left, the southwest again, which is our tundra site, it's actually pretty wet. But we don't have any eddy flux data here to know what's going on year round. If anybody would like to put something there, I'd love to be able to look at the data, so let me know. Um, most of the, eddy f the places I've indicated here are eddy flux towers that are, do year-round measurements. And this is on the north slope. So if we look at the regional budget for the carbon, we're looking at a lot of methane emissions from the tundra areas and the north slope. So do we have enough year-round data in those areas to fully understand what's going on on an annual scale? And these eddy flux towers are Donna and Waltz, and then there's the Tulik that Eugenie Oskirkin runs. And then there's also some towers that are year-round in the Fairbanks area, Bonanza Creek, uh, UAF, Healy. I've kind of all put them all in together in the one area. Um, so we have some coverage of the state of Alaska. We don't have a lot. We have even less if you try and go into the entire above domain, but I'm not going to go into that here. What we do have... Um, in this area up in the north is a long-term NOAA tower that a lot of you may have heard of as the Barrow Tower um, that has been used in airborne and atmospheric analysis for the past 40 years. It's a really good long record. Now most of the time when you hear of the Barrow record, it's looking at the clean air sector, they're looking at an integrated signal over all of the um, vegetation in pretty much the northern hemisphere. It's looking at that overall integrated signal, and they detect that coming in from what we call the ocean sector, which is they're looking at the Arctic Ocean CO2 signal. But that's not the only data that's available from that site. It's what everybody is told to use as their background measurement. There's also the land sector. So certain time periods, and this, as far as I can tell, this really only works for Barrow because of the meteorology and the site location. We can look at the land sector and we use the background from the ocean sector as our background integrated uniform signal, and we look at enhancements in the land sector. And the graphs I have here show the different footprints, so it's the surface influence on the Barrow Tower that we see for different areas. Um, and you can see that actually the Barrow Tower, even though it's only, well, I guess it's 28 meters above sea level, actually sees quite a lot of the whole of the North Slope at different times of the year. And this is for 2012 to 2014, when we also have airborne measurements. So this is the overall time series. So we're looking at the CO2 signal. And what you can see here is the overall growth that we're seeing globally. We can also see the seasonal cycle. And the blue data is the ocean sector data. The orange is an interpolated um, product for background for that ocean signal. And then you can kind of see little bits of red sticking up underneath, which is the land sector signal that we're looking at. So if we take the 
the uh, fall signal for each of those. What I've done is bin the data into uh, different parts. And in September, over the last 40 years, we haven't seen much of a change in the CO2 signal coming from the tundra. However, in October, November, and December, we actually see quite a large change in the CO2. And it's pretty significant. Um, so if we look at how is that changing over time, if we take October to December for each of those years and look at the time series, we're looking at nearly a 70% increase in the amount of CO2 being respired from the tundra on the North Slope over the past 40 years. However, most of that is driven by the first 10 years of our signal. A lot of it is the pre-1990 CO2 was much lower. So if we keep that in mind, if we want to look at CO2 and methane, we then need to worry about what time periods are we looking at. <coughs> Excuse me. So Colm Sweeney um, published a paper, paper in GRL in 2016, and it was looking at no significant change in the July to December methane signal. But they did see some increase in the November-December time period. And you can see, I just pull, pulled out figure two from his paper here. There's a 0.7 ppb per year increase in the methane in the uh, November-December time period, which is about a 20, PP increase, 20 ppb increase over the 30 years. So if we look at that in the data as I, I have been looking at it, um, you can see here for the 30-year time record, so from 1986 all the way up to present day, so I've gone up to 2015 for nice binning, we're looking at not as much of a change in the CO2. We see September, we see, still see a little bit of uptake. Then October, November, December, we see the signal drop away into January and February, where we see no significant signal of CO2 respiration at all. For methane, however, we don't see a huge change between the time periods. What we do see is that the methane emission continues all the way into February. So we're looking at different <coughs> types of emission profiles. And some of what I was thinking about is, is this because we're looking at different temp temperature perturbations at different soil temperatures? And this is from Donna's paper. We're looking at the permafrost is at the bottom, the soil temperature at the very top level. We see a, as into the winter, as the temperatures get really cold, we freeze from the top down. So the surface layer where the methane is consumed and where CO2 is produced begins to freeze. But the layer where the uh, methane is produced freezes that bit later. And is that what we're seeing on a regional scale with the Barrow Tower data? So looking at the time series, we actually don't see a huge change. So it's about, if we include 2012, it's about a 30% increase in the CO2 signal in the fall in October to December, which is about half what we're seeing over the 40-year time record. But the methane is not showing a significant difference. So in the long term, we're looking at regional tower observations that seem to give us a pretty good picture of what's going on on the regional scale on the North Slope. We're learning something about the ecosystems there. So we have CO2 respiration and methane consumption seems to shut off before January. The methane production seems to continue until the soils are completely frozen. Um, the 70% increase in the October to December CO2 that we saw at Barrow, 30% over 30 years, so we're seeing much less of a signal. And there's been no significant change in the methane. So is this due to temperature, uh, to changes in the soil temperature profiles? And that's something I'd like to chat with people a bit more. This, we seem to be seeing that in the eddy flux data also, where the methane signal continues a lot longer than the CO2. So hopefully we can parse out what exactly is driving all these different parts. So thank you. Very wisely left yourself a couple of uh, time questions. for a couple of questions. Well, you told me to. <laughs> <laughs> How many people don't? <laughs> Anybody have questions? Looking. A lot of very sleepy faces. Yeah. I don't think people had coffee this morning. Yeah, there's one back there. Yep, so Scott Miller's, it's a geostatistical inversion of the airborne data. 
So S Scott could probably answer that better, but yes, there is a very large signal from the dead horse area. There's not a lot of methane leaking there, but there is some signal when you come into the town. So it depends on how you carefully select your data when you're looking at that. For the CO2, we had to be a lot more careful because any time we came into areas like cities, not that they are large cities, we were very careful to take out all of that data as non-biogenic. Um, I don't know exactly what Scott did for this. Yeah, he says he took out most of that as well. I'm seeing a, a head nod in the corner. Was it significant? Okay. <laughs> Colm, who's coming up at the end of the session, could probably answer that even better. I think it was selected for CO, so pollution. So apparently CO is a pretty good tracer for methane on the north slope, uh, anthropogenic methane. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Richie. So our next speaker is um, Efren Lopez Blanco, uh, analysis of interannual variability of CO2 exchange in Arctic tundra. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Efren Lopez. I'm a joint PhD between Aarhus University and Edinburgh University. And I am mostly interested in carbon exchange balances in the Arctic. And this talk will be on how we use uh, field observations and model together in order, in order to better understand the mechanisms driving the carbon cycling in Arctic ecosystems. But first of all, I'd like to start with this question, why the Arctic? Why are we interested in the Arctic? And I'm pretty sure that now everybody is quite aware that the temperatures are rising um, there, are, there are few items that makes the Arctic quite unique. There is quite a substantial amount of carbon being stored uh, in the Arctic, and also it has been experienced an intensified uh, warming nearly twice as the global average. Um, and unfortunately, the forecast doesn't look promising, and it's expected to be even more pronounced. So given this situation, we should improve our process-based understanding on carbon fluxes, as well as the climate sensitivity. So, as I say, the aim for this presentation is to show you how we use field observations together with model in order to better understand carbon exchange, but also the um, biological uh, interactions. And in order to do so, I'm going to divide the presentation in two different sub-projects. The very first one is on eight years of data from uh, citing West Greenland. Um, and then uh, we have a follow-up uh, modeling exercise over this, uh, this project. The site is located in West Greenland, right here, it's, uh, close to Nook, the Greenlandic capital. Um, the data comes from the uh, Greenland Ecosystem, Ecosystem Monitoring Program. Uh, it's a low Arctic fang, and there is no permafrost. It's about 16 kilometers from Nuuk, the Greenlandic capital, and the site looks like this. It's a fair uh, extensive uh, monitoring program going on. I'm going to focus in a net ecosystem exchange data from the fence site here. There is also uh, different uh, soil temperature profiles spread around the valley, as well as few micrometeorological stations and one camera here which uh, we derive um, plant phenology data as well as um, a snow cover. This is how the site looks like, and I must admit that it's extremely beautiful. And this is a closer overview about the fence surrounded by the heath and the copes. So in terms of uh, interannual variability, we have eight years of data that we compare against uh, long data set from the Danish Meteorological Institute. And uh, there is a tendency towards warmer and wetter conditions. But if we just take the eight years data set uh, and we divide it by seasons, we see a large express, spread in terms of interannual variability. For example, 2010 and 2012 tend to be warmer and wetter. 
weather than 2011 and 2015 are colder and drier. And even from year to year, there are large uh, differences. From the Deflux Tower, we get uh, net ecosystem exchange data, which uh, at the end we partition into GPP, photosynthesis, and uh, respiration, our eco. The typical pattern in terms of NEE is an initial increase of respiration followed by a sharp uptake of carbon, and then eventually at the end of the season we have again a release of carbon. Um, from this figure we can see that no matter how variable the climate is, the meteorology is, sorry, um, the range of NEE is quite small. So this is suggesting that NEE is kind of insensitive to the, meteor the meteorological drivers. Whereas if we have a look to GBP and Arico, the spread is way lar larger. Also we see kind of a mirror image which is suggesting that GBP and Arico are coupled. Whenever we have more carbon uptake, we have more respiration. But then you maybe wonder what happened with this year, 2011, was a fair uh, source of carbon. And it was associated with a moth outbreak. It's a tiny larvae. Here in the left-hand side, we can see oops, um, the valley, which is quite brown. And exactly the same date for the following year uh, is uh, way uh, greener. So you can see there is a substantial change, and that was mainly due to a uh, moth outbreak. So it's very important also to take into account biological disturbance in the annual carbon budget. But from this project, we found some challenge. So there is a high interannual variability. Is it really a eight snow-free periods enough to talk about interannual variability? We also found many gaps in the data because it's very... Uh, um, harsh conditions and um, also due to instrument malfunction. We don't have round year data, which complicates the discussion of carbon sink and carbon sun's strength. Also, we didn't assess uh, important variables like snow cover on depth. So we propose a follow-up uh, modeling exercise to try to uh, quantify the role of uh, the cold period of, uh, across full annual cycles, as well as what is driving this NEE insensitivity or GPP RE sensitivity, trying to untangle the competing ecosystem processes. So in order to do so, we use a um, model so-called SPA, soil plant atmosphere. It's a high vertical mechanistic point model, um, very high temporal resolution up to uh, 30 minutes uh, time step. We are allowed up to 10 canopy layers and 20 soil layers. Uh, the parameterization of the model is at leaf level and the prediction is at canopy level. Inside this model, we have a small carbon cycle subcomponent, which is uh, giving us information on plant phenology and also carbon dynamics, such as carbon allocation, litter fall, or decomposition. For this project, we use some of the data to try to constrain beta the model. For instance, we took the percentage of greenness data from the camera that is pointing toward the valley, and we correlated with um, a leaf area index model by the, by the model. And uh, the, correl the correlation seems to be quite good. Also, it helped us to define the timing of the phenology in the model. We also use a snow cover data to try to constrain the soil temperatures model by the model. Because if we want to say something about winter time periods, we should uh, try to constrain these parameters. And the results jump from correlations of 0.6 to 0.9 when we include snow. So in terms of NEE, GBP, and RECO, this is the data that I showed before and compared with the model. In terms of NEE, we have a fair good agreement, close to 0.75. And then in terms of GPP, 0.73, um, we, we, it's quite challenging to uh, model properly uh, respiration. And we have few bias, for example, here in terms of shifts of timing, but also in order of magnitude here. But what I want to say, 2011, the moth year, we fail, we do not uh, model it um, 
completely perfect, but the model is suggesting that there is um, a problem with the phenology. And this specific year, apart from the moth outbreak, it was a very cold winter with, a, with the thickest snow pack, also a very cold June, and followed by a very uh, cloudy July plus the moth. So all these combinations are uh, leading to this uh, mismatch in terms of modeling. But then when, once that we are kind of happy with the setup of the model, we try to uh, test some hypotheses. And for instance, when we saw this figure before from observations, any E tends to be insensitive to the climate. Is it the case also in the model? And how about for the full annual cycle? Um, the model tends to agree with the observations. And in terms of the full annual cycle, there is a shift of upwards in terms of, carbo of decrease of carbon sink strength. So that means that even though the respiration is small, but it's quite long. So it's important to take these processes and with the time uh, in account for the annual budget. Another question that we have is, what is driving the coupling between GBP and ARICO that we found? In order to do so, we try to partition a, 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 um, ARICO into a smaller components such as autotrophic respiration, um, which is growth respiration and maintenance respiration, together with heter heterotrophic respiration. And the model is suggesting that in the outer, outer shoulders of the growing season, uh, heterotrophic respiration is the, domin the dominating uh, component, whereas in the inner part of the growing season, GBP together with growth respiration and heterotrophic respiration dominates. If we just have a look to the annual pattern, we still see that um, the balance is quite tight, although GBP tends to uh, dominate a little bit. Uh, for example, in 2011, there was a shorter growing season, therefore there was less GBP, and that's why also um, here, heterotrophic respiration is a bit higher. But related to this, we test a sensitivity analysis on the vegetation parameters that we use to force the model, to run the model. And we have uh, 36 here. I am just showing the 20 most uh, sensible. And something that we realize is that the most sensitive ones let's say average foliar nitrogen and maximum foliar carbon stocks, as well as leaf mass per area, let's say plant traits, are the most sensitive. And if we compare both the sensitivity for GBP and for ARICO, we see that they're quite similar, which kind of suggests that plant traits can be uh, important uh, controllers in the GBP and ARICO coupling. Also, we can say that, luckily, the most sensitive uh, parameters were collecting from the field, which means that it's uh, very good to have some data to help uh, and constrain the model. Just concluding, so the SPA model is able to represent around 74% of uh, NEE, 73% of GBP, 50% of ARICO, and 85% of plant phenology. The model also suggests that winter time plays an important role in annual budgets, increasing, decreasing the carbon sink strength by 50% or more. Plant trade seems to be uh, key controllers in the GPP, ARECO, the photosynthesis and respiration coupling. And these two last points, discrepancies between model and data can be used to know better uh, knowledge gaps and also ecological indicators, like for example in 2011. We also need more data model integration as well as more data to constrain the model. That's it, thank you very much. And I would just uh, would like to advertise uh, the Greenlandic Ecosystem Monitoring Program database where you can just download this data for free and there is more GEM-related uh, studies along this week, so please join. Thank you very much.
for one question. So, uh, nice talk. Um, I wonder how much confidence you have in your observations of annual NEV. Because you talked about some missing data, and there's also the fact that you generally don't close the energy budget in the many covariance towers, you probably don't close carbon either. So your, your model is that half of your sink that you saw in the observation. But how confident are you with that observation? Um, we have uh, a recent publication on just the observations and the uncertainty around any were about five to ten grams, uh, sorry, five grams of carbon per square meter. So... Out of the annual sink of what? Sorry? What, what was your, I don't, I don't remember the numbers on your annual sink. For example... Yeah, it was not too big. And we took into account the USR filtering, random uncertainty, and another error, but uh, I don't remember. We include three sources of errors in this computation, which are not shown in this figure, by the way. I need to do a little keyboard switch. Next talk, Jennifer Watts on um, detecting recent changes in the Arctic boreal carbon sink using satellite remote sensing. Uh, and this is your. No. Oh, okay. All right, so I think we've already heard from the other presenters a little bit of this overview. Why are we even interested in these Arctic boreal regions? Well, one of them is that it, they hold a lot of carbon, over 50% of the world's stored soil carbon, and, and something's gonna happen to it, right? These regions, we know they're warming. A lot of them are warming quite a bit. And so as that warming occurs, you have this thaw of the organic layer, the soil layer, and that becomes very available for microbial uh, decomposition. And the other thing we have to keep in mind too, we talk a lot about warming, but at the same time we're also having changes in our hydrology. This is from northern Siberia, you see this ice, as it starts melting we have a collapse of soil and this release of water initial melting thaw of the permafrost, we tend to get more wet soils, and with continued thaw and drying over time, it changes quite a bit, so we have a very different soil system. All right, so the research questions that have been driving my work start out with, how are these changes, these changes in temperature and these changes in hydrology, how are they affecting vegetation carbon uptake? And then the loss of terrestrial carbon as CO2 and methane, so greenhouse gas loss. And to answer these questions, I've been working with a remote sensing informed carbon model, uh, the terrestrial carbon flux model. And I've been using this model to evaluate annual carbon budgets across the 2003 to 2015 record. So this is kind of based on the MODIS record working forward. And then assessing ecosystem carbon sink source activity across the Arctic boreal regions and identifying the regional trends in the carbon balance. So are we staying carbon neutral? Are we moving to a net carbon sink with increase in vegetation productivity or GPP? Or are we moving to a carbon source with increased respiration? So to, I'll give you an overview of the TCF, the terrestrial carbon flux model. This is a, has been developed as a remote sensing model. We use it more as a diagnostic model. We're using it over the remote sensing record. We're not looking forward in time. And so our model inputs, we're using a reanalysis. This is the NASA MARA GMAO product, and this is at half degree. We're also, and that's using for our air temperature, our vapor pressure deficit, our radiation loading, soil temperature, soil moisture, and also our wind, which is influential for our methane output. 
We're also looking at incorporating into the model various inputs from satellite information, and this includes the MODIS in NDVI or FPAR, which gives us our fraction of uh, radiation, or kind of is an indicator of how much biomass is available for photosynthesis to take place on the landscape. And you'll see that these are at variable resolutions, 250 to one kilometer. We're also using passive microwave information, and this gives us a sense of how, the, if, is the land frozen or is it thawed on the landscape? And inundation, do we have flooding occurring on our landscape? And then finally, we need land cover maps to inform our model. So we ingest all this information into the terrestrial carbon flux model, and we first look at productivity, so our GPP, uh, and we estimate our GPP based on how much radiation is available for photosynthesis and that biomass indicator, and then vapor pressure deficit, minimum temperature, soil moisture constraints, so if we have a very dry soil, we may limit our GPP, or if we have a very wet soil system, and the vegetation there is not acclimated to a wet soil system, we may also have a loss of GPP. So keep that in mind. And I'll also point out epsilon max. This is our parameter for conversion, carbon conversion efficiency. And this is, we calculate this based on land cover classifications. So again, that land cover is very important. So after we estimate our GPP, and this is a daily basis, we then account for autotrophic CO2 loss from vegetation. And then a portion of that, the ingested carbon coming into um, our landscape through vegetation, we then partition that into our soil system. And we use metabolic, structural, and recalcitrant carbon pools, so variable decomposition rates for each pool. We regulate the amount of decomposition occurring in our pool, again, with uh, temperature and moisture constraints. And then finally, if we have a wetland on our land cover class, we then look at how much methane is being produced. And this, again, has temperature and moisture constraints. And we're regulating this not just with inundation, but also with how much saturation we have in our pore space. And then we have a, a methane pool that we generate for each grid cell, and then we regulate the amount of methane going out into the atmosphere through a plant transport, soil diffusion, and then ebullition, so bubbling out into the atmosphere. So the steps I had to go through to actually come up with my carbon maps I had to start at the very beginning because I, I need something to evaluate and train my model with. And for this, I used eddy covariance tower data. So I knocked on the doors about uh, 34 PIs. And for some of them, I got data. And that was, I'm very grateful for that data. And you see the towers for the eddy covariance sites are these red circles across the Arctic domain. And then the, the next thing I needed was a vegetation map. There wasn't a map that I found to be suitable for what I needed. And I ended up merging um, MODIS land cover. The European Space Agency has a, a Maris project, uh, product, Landsat land cover, so uh, in circuit, circumpolar Arctic vegetation map, and then peatland maps as well. And uh, through this merge land cover, I ended up getting something that included not only different types of tundra, but also peatland, different boreal wetland classes that I needed for my purposes since I was including methane. Another step I had to do since I came up with this very different land cover classification, I needed to go back into my model and reevaluate my lookup table for my parameters. So that's an, another step that was necessary for this project. And then finally, what I ended up doing for each eddy covariance tower site, I ran the model across the 13-year record, so 03 all the way through 2015. And then after I felt comfortable with my results there, I went ahead and extended it to this entire Panarctic domain. So, and then I'll remind you, I used multiple data sets. 
and this ingestion into the model. And these are also, they're all at different spatial resolutions. So keep that in mind. I am constrained by sensitivity of the, the half degree Maris, uh, Mara product. So first I spin up my model from 1989 to 02 to get my climatology and build up my carbon pools. I then go forward in time through 2015. My outputs are daily and I ended up with a one kilometer uh, spatial resolution across this domain. And then finally, before I'm able to get my total carbon budget, this is just a terrestrial model. And so I'm excluding any lake and river area at the end. So to give you an example of what the model output looks like, if you, the above, um, everything in green is not ecosystem exchange. So this is accounting for GPP and then my respiration loss. And everything that's negative indicates a carbon sink. Positive values indicate carbon source. Open circles are my tower eddy covariance observations. Uh, and then the lines are my model output. And then on the bottom, everything in blue, that's methane. So I'm showing three different tower sites. The mirror blue, this is my southern boreal peatland, a little bit warmer, not, no permafrost here. Moving northward, I have the Tanana Flats uh, Bonanza Creek, boreal bog, not as much peatland. Um, it really varies uh, with the hydrology. So sometimes it's flooded, sometimes uh, it's a little bit drier in the summer. And then moving forward northward to Ivatuk Tussock, this is the upland tussock site um, that is affected by the permafrost. And we'll see, I'll point out that for overall, we're doing pretty well with the terrestrial carbon flux model. But for certain regions, especially I'll point out Tanana Flats, you'll see in the spring and in the fall, we have this pulse of CO2 being released from the soil that we're just not able to capture with the model. And then in Ivatuk in the fall, we have this freezing of the soil, release of CO2, and again, not able to capture by the model. This is a deep soil process that we're not, um, our model is not set up to accommodate. With methane in the spring, um, we overestimate their pulse of methane at Tanana Flats, and this has to do with our hydrology inputs. I pointed out a little bit earlier that we're using coarser resolution inputs for our soil moisture from Mara and our inundation from passive microwave. And so this is giving us an indication of um, areas outside that flux tower that are more saturated. And so we're overestimating for that flux tower site. Now, when I look at the total carbon budgets for these flux towers across the Pan Arctic, I start to get a sense of, you know, what's happening over time? Are we in a carbon source, not carbon sink? And above we have, so GPP, tundra and boreal sites. Tundra are shown on the top, boreal on the bottom. We have our ecosystem respiration, net ecosystem exchange, our methane in blue. And what you'll notice when we look at all these tundra sites together for these edicovariance towers, that we're hovering right around zero. It depends on the year, sometimes where carbon sink, other times we're a carbon source. And so you really need to start looking at long-term records to be able to get a better idea of what's happening in your domain. When we look at boreal, we're still a, a pretty strong carbon sink, but it really, again, depends on the year. Sometimes we have dry years, we don't have as much productivity. If we have dry years and it's not too wet, we also have a lot of uh, CO2 emissions as well, which uh, transitions us over to this carbon, closer and closer to a carbon source. So what I'll, I'll point out when I look at trends over time for these Arctic sites, for the tower sites, 
I don't really pick up any trends except for NEE when I look at upland tussock. So upland tussocks over time are transitioning closer and closer to a net carbon source. And this is probably dry because of drying in the hydrology. And if you look at, for methane, if you look at these boreal sites, we actually are seeing a trend that they're becoming more of a methane source. They're staying wet, they're warming, and they're producing methane. So I'll also point out too, overall for the net budget, Tundra NEE negative 2.9 grams of carbon meter squared. Uh, if you look at CO or the methane, it's five grams of carbon squared per meter squared. Uh, not a lot, so you still have this. It's enough to offset the carbon intake from NEE. And if you look at CO2 equivalents, if you consider that methane is 25 times, at least 25 times more potent uh, than CO2, then all of a sudden, if you look at CO, CO2 equivalents, it's quite strong uh, potential for radiative forcing in the atmosphere. Again, boreal, NEE, it's a strong carbon sink. You have a little bit of methane, but if you consider that radiative forcing, again, it's a, a strong contributor to warming in the atmosphere. Moving into the Pan-Arctic domain, these are the TCF carbon maps. You'll see that everything in brown um, and orange, that's a carbon source. And for methane, everything in the red, that's moving and moving into a stronger car uh, methane emission source as well. Now, ecosystem carbon balance, uh, methane is offsetting some of that NEE but for the boreal domain, it's still quite a carbon sink. And when we look into the above domain, I'm almost out of time, but I just want to point out for methane that for South um, West Alaska, we need a flux tower there. There's a lot of methane occurring. We don't have any eddy covariance records to check that. Mm -hmm. And I'll also point out too, if you look at trends over every grid cell in this domain, what we see is that in the red, we're moving towards a lot of ecosystem respiration. And this is being uh, influenced by warming across the domain. And in Alaska, we, we have areas that are drying, so reducing our methane, but we're also having wetting and warming. So in conclusion, we're still a net carbon sink, but if you look at the effects of radiative forcing by methane, it's quite strong, and so we need to keep methane in consideration. Uh, soil wetting and drying is an important driver of methane, so that's something that needs to be accounted for in our models and in our analyses. We have no net trend in tundra, uh, but we do have a trend in boreal methane production, and that's increasing. Local trends matter, regional budgets don't tell the complete story. And the non-growing season respiration in this model it estimates uh, that 25 to 40% of the non-growing season um, accounts for our annual budget, but we may be underestimating this in our models and in our shoulder season, so it's quite important to look at. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next talk, got to get, Josh, you can come on up. There he is. There we go. Uh, this is not Debbie Hunsaker, uh, <laughs> a man who needs no introduction, Josh Fisher. Yep. Hi, I'm Debbie Hunsinger. <laughs> um, I've gotten a little bit taller, and I can now bench press over 200 pounds. Um, yeah, Debbie uh, 
couldn't make it. She, last second, she gave me a call this weekend, went over the slides really quickly, so hopefully I can do it justice. Although, I think both my kids and her kids were both screaming at us the whole time, so if I start talking about the movie Frozen instead of Soils uh, Frozen, I apologize. Um, so, but her slides are interesting and these results are interesting, so I hope I do do them some justice. Um, and it is, uh, starts with kind of a fairy tale th about the soil carbon, and this is very much the sleeping dragon that we are awakening. Um, and we don't know how big the dragon is, and we don't know um, how much we're waking it up by, and we don't know what it's going to do. Um, and, and, and I think that's what drives a lot of the motivation for um, a lot of our work up in, in the Arctic and boreal region. Um, we, we've seen this type of plot uh, many times. It's this uncertainty about uh, soil carbon with respect to our models. Um, enormous stocks and enormous uncertainties, um, at, both in terms of the, the current state as well as the change. And we have a lot of conflicting um, pointers uh, in the modeling community. We have, uh, for instance, the CMIP, um, the CMIP models showing uptake of carbon in, in the Arctic Boreal, but then we have um, uh, warm experiments and other types of measurements showing uh, large losses. And so we are very much pulled in, in multiple ways um, on, on the trajectories. And there's, there's flaws in both um, types of data sets, and they're not exactly apples to apples comparisons either. So we're very much, um, we're very much kind of stuck uh, as to figuring out how to advance. So um, what Debbie has uh, spearheaded is the MISTIMIT project. Um, and this is a, a, a big multi-model intercomparison and factorial analysis where um, she's, the, the, the team or the group of modelers have teased apart the, um, the, the drivers and the controls over different ecosystem processes. And so they run um, a lot of different scenarios where they have a constant, uh, they have a, the, a common forcing data set, so we know that differences in models aren't due to differences in forcing data. They have common spin-up protocols, um, common equilibrium conditions, so we know differences in models aren't due to that. And then they turn on and off different drivers, keeping some constant and some varying, um, that being CO2, climate, nitrogen, um, and land use for, for those models who have nitrogen and so on. So um, it, it, it's definitely, I think, the, uh, very much a cutting edge uh, model into comparison. The trendy um, uh, MIP out of, uh, led by Stephen Sitch is also very similar, although I think this is even more rigorous. So um, if we look at the ensemble median of soil carbon, um, you know, it's this kind of upper left brown blob of soil carbon. And then the NCSD, um, uh, you know, some sort of benchmark or truth is in the top right. Um, of course, there's large spread for that ensemble standard deviation. And then relative uh, to the NCSD, are, are, is the ensemble median getting those observations right? Well, they're either way too high or way too low. It's very, uh, very much not um, <clears throat> the, the, right, the right amount. So what's going on? Let's drill into this a little bit. Um, here are the models that uh, Debbie looked at. Um, and it's not all the models in Misty MIP. I think uh, she was just looking at those that did the soil carbon. Not all of them did the soil carbon. And what we see is in the dashed line, the NCSD uh, one meter soil carbon, and where the models kind of lie on that. And, and they're not, you know, some are close, but some are quite far. Um, she also shows over in the solid black line, far off into the 278 petagram range, the zero to three meters. So then we got to start asking questions about soil depth. But before we start doing that, um, what's particularly interesting, and I think what this highlights more than what I've seen in model analyses, are those um, open black circles behind the red circles. That's where my eye immediately went to when she was showing me these, and where I immediately stopped her and said, what is going on? 
Um, this is something that's very nice about MistyMip. As, as I said, common spin-up protocols, common equilibrium conditions. And so that is the steady state at 1901. Uh, after the spin-up, all the models have equilibrated um, and um, you know, everybody's happy. You know, models aren't changing in their soil carbon stocks uh, globally or for any grid cell, actually, it is. Um, and, and temperature and, there's a, and, and NEE, there's other requirements there. So from 1901 to 2000, which would be the NCSD, the kind of 2000s, um, you can see how the models have moved or not moved um, over the century. And this is, this is interesting and alarming and uh, curious in many ways. Uh, I think it shows, and I might be jumping to our conclusion, conclusions already, but I'm just excited about this plot. Uh, it, it shows how important that steady state condition is, uh, or, or maybe not. Um, if, if the models are not getting that steady state condition uh, right, then they're going to be far off because they're not moving in the right direction. They're also not moving much at all. Um, some are losing soil carbon, some are, some are gaining uh, for different reasons. And um, I think this, uh, this drills down into some of that uh, uncertainty that we're seeing across the models. And it starts with that steady state. And how do, you con how do you constrain to a steady state? We don't have observations in 1901. It's hard to cheat. Uh, I think a lot of the models can you know, use present day observations to constrain parameters. But you can't do that for 1901. So you're kind of stuck with equilibrium conditions that uh, drive the rest of your century. And um, I think it's very challenging. So that's one take home message, I think, here. Um, and we'll get to how to resolve that later. So uh, moving to the soil depth, which would be the next question. Uh, it, this is a tricky thing. Um, the models are uh, reporting different depths. Um, and, but you would think that a model with larger depth would have more soil carbon, but that's not actually the case. Um, so uh, I don't really know what's going on here, but. Um, I know that there are some of you in the audience that are, are, whose models are up here, and maybe you can explain more. But um, yeah, th these are still very much hot off the press results. Um, I don't have too much more to say on soil depth, as far as I can remember. She had notes for me on this, but it's not showing up here. Um, <clears throat> all right, sensitivity, sensitivity to change. So <clears throat> she can, so, so, so through the MISTI MIP, we can look at how the, um, the soil carbon uh, is responding to the different drivers. So for instance, we've got um, a change in total soil carbon because of climate. So if you see like LPJ has this big blue bar, it's very sensitive to uh, soil carbon loss due to climate. That sounds like a good thing. Um, but then you've got ORCID A um, uh, increasing soil carbon because it's very sensitive to CO2 fertilization, it's getting a lot more input from vegetation growth um, and not as much loss from climate. Um, TEM has, is responsive to uh, land cover change. So this is, this is interesting. It starts to drill down a little bit more into the change aspects. But again, she, she has this little inset up to the right that says the change is all well and good, but it, these models are not changing that much. Um, relative, I guess it's like a change of you know, five petagrams of carbon, but we're talking about 100 petagrams of carbon that is the target, so it's not that big of a change. Um, <clears throat> all right, so now, so now the next step is really to look at the sensitivity aspects, so uh, especially to change. So she's looking at um, residence time, or the apparent residence time, because it, residence, residence time would assume equilibrium conditions, and so she has this apparent residence time per decade. Um, and looking at the respiration, the heterotrophic respiration <coughs> versus the soil carbon to get that apparent residence time. Um, and I think she mentioned that she would be afraid of Michelle Mack attacking me because I didn't include disturbance or something. Um, but so I will hide from Michelle Mack. <coughs> um, so the sensitivity to apparent soil carbon residence time is shown here. Um, and so we're, okay, I can't remember the take home messages here, but um, probably similar to the, to the soil carbon, uh, we see kind of the same stuff. Climate is a big driver here, and then CO2 fertilization uh, sometimes more than climate. 
All right. Um, so I, I, I guess looking at this sensitivity to change aspect, um, starting to look at these response functions. So this was contributed by Kevin Schaefer. I don't know if Kevin's in the room. Um, but um, so I, I guess the idea is this really drills down into how well a model represents that, uh, that change, that sensitivity to change, that, you know, that sleeping dragon. How, how sensitive is that dragon going to be uh, once it wakes up? And um, we might not know how big it is, but if we knew how big it is, this would be the next step to know the sensitivity. So looking at different types of um, uh, response functions. So uh, temperature, soil temperature versus heterotrophic respiration. Um, so, or I guess starting on the right side, uh, it's a little bit easier to understand. So if we look at the top right uh, from, <clears throat> I think it's uh, from flux data, right? So um, uh, Kevin compiled a bunch of data of uh, probably heterotrophic respiration um, against probably soil temperature. And there's this response function that we see. And, um, we, and then if you look underneath it, these are what the models are doing. Or I guess there's even fewer models now. Um, and <clears throat> so we can see that some models are getting the shape of that well. So for instance, if you look at the red and yellow one in the bottom right, those would be CLM and CLM for Vic. But, um, they look to have a, a really nice response function, but they were like way off in the soil carbon uh, stock originally. So um, is CLM good or bad? Well, it's, it's good in the response function, bad in the, uh, in, in the total, total stock. But if it were good in the total stock, if it had a good um, steady state, then it might be one of the better ones. But if it doesn't, then it's one of the, the worst ones. So challenging to uh, interpret. Um, <clears throat> on the left here, there's incubation data. Um, again, developing these response functions for turnover time and then looking at the shape. These are um, kind of units that aren't exactly comparable. This is still a little bit tricky, but um, I, I guess the idea is we're starting to look at the sensitivity aspects and really trying to compare apples to apples um, data versus model output to start to really assess uh, how to improve the models. Good. All right. So <clears throat> some of the conclusions. So uh, carbon cycling is uh, occurring faster through the Arctic and Boreal, um, largely due to climate warming and CO2 fertilization. So uh, warming is, is speeding that up. But then the CO2 fertilization is also driving more carbon inputs uh, in at a, at a faster rate, which is also uh, contributing to the acceleration of um, carbon cycling. And then, the, however, the initial carbon pool size um, is this main control on the magnitude of both the future solar carbon stocks and the soil turnover, which uh, I think uh, I highlighted pretty well. Um, and so I guess model evaluation should focus on assessing the robustness of model sensitivity to key environmental drivers. Um, so it should focus on that, but it should also focus on getting those initial stocks right, I would add. And then, um, and then so we're developing these functional response met benchmarks that really target the stock and flux behavior with changing conditions um, as a key need. I think that's the last slide. And, um, and, and I was talking with Debbie about ideas of how to constrain that 1901 uh, steady state. And, and I don't have a good idea, but I can imagine if we have a pretty good idea, well, pretty good, uh, like if we assume NCSD is, is pretty good for present day solar carbon, and we know what the the change of it to warming uh, is from our sensitivity analyses, and we know what the warming was over the last century, we could kind of back calculate what the 1901 steady state solar carbon, NCSD of 1901, using the sensitivity. And maybe if we could constrain the models to that, we can move forward from there as, as some sort of launching point. I don't know, we were just, we were just talking and then our kids started jumping on us, so um, we didn't get very far in that. But, um, ideas, I think it's not all doom and gloom as a lot of these model anal analyses uh, talks go. Um, I think there's definitely an interesting path forward and I think Debbie's work and the MISTI MIP really starts to drill down in a way that uh, just looking at models um, and their uh, differences uh, has not in previous analyses. And that's it. Thanks. All right. So if you have any questions, just
Call it Debbie. Don't talk to me. Our next speaker is going to be Ted Scher, and he's going to talk about rapid changes in the permafrost soil carbon pool in response to warming. Is the yellow light going at 12? Is that 12? 12. Okay. okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, my talk is going to shift gears a little bit in terms of scale, but keep on the same theme. And uh, really, my title sort of gives the bottom punchline, which is, um, we're actually directly measuring at a single site um, big changes in the soil carbon pool we just heard about in the modeling talk last. Um, I am representing really a large group of people in my lab that have been working on this project over the past number of years, and I'd like to thank them. There's uh, quite a few in the audience, so thanks for coming this morning. Um, do I advance with the... Oh, okay, mouse only. Okay, um, we heard about the sleeping dragon. I mean, it's pretty well quantified, at least for the Arctic. It's about 1,480 to 1,600 petagrams of carbon stored frozen in these organic soils. So that's about twice as much carbon than that's in the atmosphere. Um, we haven't looked at this picture yet, and it shows a number of um, features of permafrost ground. We're actually looking below the ground here in this eroded hill slope. Um, up at the top, that red bar is showing you that what we call the active layer. That's the seasonally, um, the seasonally thawed layer at the surface that thaws in the summer and refreezes in the winter. And below that is the permafrost. That's the perennially frozen ground. And I think this picture is kind of cool because it shows that the distribution of the, of the carbon in the soil is interspersed with these big blocks of, of ice. And this is a particularly ice-rich soil in Siberia and really shows you that um, that potential for big changes in the frozen ground as the climate starts to warm. So we've been sort of asking the same question that's the theme of this session, which is how much of this carbon that's stored frozen can enter the atmosphere? Um, how fast will that happen? Is that a decades-long process or centuries-long process? And what's the relative emissions of carbon dioxide and methane? Because that has the impact back on climate. So those three things really control how fast this Arctic carbon release has an impact on our future climate. Now, I'm an ecosystem ecologist. I've been studying this um, at a research site at the Eight Mile Lake study area with my research group. We initially landed here um, because of a borehole put in the ground by uh, Tom Osterkamp. And he initially observed the permafrost start to degrade in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And we set up observational me uh, measurements on what we call the permafrost thaw gradient here that really looked at this sort of natural permafrost degradation over time. And we tried to quantify changes in carbon balance as a result. Um, we've since extended that work, um, adding on a manipulation experiment. And that's what I'm going to be talking about mostly today. Um, where we've actually uh, are thawing the permafrost and warming the tundra and trying to create conditions in the future. And so we've been asking these two core questions. As, as permafrost ecosystems warm, what's the change in the ecosystem carbon balance? And that's what we've been hearing about. Um, we've also had a focus on um, asking whether this old carbon, the stuff that's been frozen for hundreds to thousands of years, um, <coughs> is actually released back to the atmosphere. I'm going to show data today really focusing in on, on the first one of these two questions. Now, this air photo, um, this, this study site's a little bit different than we've been hearing about. It's tundra vegetation, but it's in the interior of Alaska. It's in the foothills of the Alaska Range. So we're a little bit further south than some of the, the tundra sites we've heard about. The permafrost is already going through widespread degradation. And this, this white line is the stampede road um, that cuts through the study site. So um, at this site, um, focusing in on the, on the manipulation, this is really a one-of-a-kind experiment where we're thawing the, the, the deep permafrost and warming the deep soil and really asking what the response is. And so um, we're doing that soil warming um, by putting up these snow fences that accumulate snow in the wintertime, and that actually keeps the tundra warmer than it otherwise would be. So you can see these drifts of snow by these snow fences in the background. <coughs> 
So we have what we call that soil warming um, manipulation. We also have an air warming where we use these open top chambers um, to warm in the summertime. And so we have those two uh, treatments sort of alone and in combination as compared to the control. So it's really the soil warming that's sort of um, deepening the active layer and um, making these soils warmer. So let me show you a little bit what this looks like um, in the fall, so late September. Um, tundra vegetation starting to senesce, turn fall colors. Uh, we put up these fences, and then in the winter time, snow is falling, but then importantly, it's blowing across the landscape, and these fences cause uh, snow to accumulate in these big drifts behind the fences. Like I said, it, it seems like more snow um, would, be, would be sort of changing the conditions here, and actually it's keeping the tundra warmer than it otherwise would be. Now we don't want the spring to come any later. We don't want any extra moisture coming into experimental plots. So we go in springtime. So this is Alaska in spring, believe it or not. Um, and we go and shovel those drifts of snow back off the plot. And so we remove the drifts. So we've warmed it in the winter, but then we've kept spring coming at the same time. So let me just show you a couple results um, from that manipulation. And just to explain this plot, these are measurements of that thaw layer at the surface, and it's actually the, the, it's the soil warming compared to the control. So the control is normalized to zero here. And so everywhere you see a point, um, we're actually looking at the influence of the experiment itself. You can see that it started off in 2009. We had a little bit of a difference in this thaw layer, so we're measuring how deep it thaws, and this increases over time. So every year we do this manipulation, we're adding more heat to the system, we're thawing more of the permafrost. And you can see in the first five years, it sort of um, increases year after year. Um, 2014, 15, and 16, I have these red arrows because these indicate these sort of breakthrough points where um, the thaw depth starts um, increasing slowly in May, but then there's a big drop, and really what that's indicating is that the soils are not refreezing in the winter time. So we have these unfrozen layers kept warmer by this manipulation, and that's gone in the last three years, except for this last winter, which was a little bit colder than it had been. So overall, we've increased the thaw depth by about 50% and created this unfrozen layer that's now sort of 12 months in the year. So it's a warming experiment, but interestingly, uh, the soil moisture conditions are also changing. So this, um, this is, again, a difference plot. So everywhere you see a bar, it's above zero. It means the warming experiment is wetter than the control. These are measurements of the, of the water table. There's water that sits on the permafrost surface. We measure it from the surface down, and so everywhere the bar is higher, it's saying that where we've warmed is actually wetter. We're only manipulating temperature, but we're getting a change in moisture, and that's because when you take the ice out of the ground and you thaw it, the ground actually collapses, and so you have this ground subsidence making the warming experiment also wetter. I have this note at the bottom, unfrozen layers, those thaw layers that didn't refreeze in the winter, they can make the soils drier but this actually um, showed up, I initially put this note in 2013 when it was very dry. You can see a couple bars below the zero line. But um, it, it only happened in the very driest of years. So in most years, this manipulation is thawing the permafrost but making things wetter. Okay, so let me focus in. So that's the manipulation, what we're doing to the experiment. We're, we're pushing this tundra ecosystem into the future. We think that this is where tundra is going as the climate will warm. Um, here I'm going to talk about sampling the soil carbon pools. So we're doing a lot of measurements of fluxes, which has been the main topic of discussion in the session. But here we're directly measuring the soil. You can see this surface organic layer at the very top. It's kind of fluffy, low bulk density. Then you go down into the surface permafrost. We collect these cores of about one meter. And we've been doing that sequentially through time, and I have data through the first half of the experiment that I'm going to show you. We measure the bulk density, the moisture, and then the, uh, the properties of the soil to quantify those carbon pools. So the main initial result that we had from this data set was that um, the warming experiment increased the bulk density. So this is the, the mass of material in a given volume. And so this shows you um, one, two, five years into the project, and we're looking at the surface of the soil down deep, and the red is the warming, and then the black is the ambient. And in general, um, you can see this difference in bulk density that, which increases over time. So that's the soil settling and becoming more compacted. And so um, it's both an effect of the treatment, which increases the, the longer that we've done it. 
Okay, so if you take the bulk density, you take the um, percent carbon, um, you can quantify the carbon pool. Um, the bulk density itself, this measurement of mass of soils, is directly connected to the moisture content. And this is a little bit different for permafrost soils, and you can see it in this picture. So here's the, the core, and you can actually see ice within the soil, and you can imagine that ice is taking up soil volume. So the more water, the more ice, the lower the bulk density, the, the, the less actually mineral soil you have. So that's um, sort of a key result for permafrost soils. Um, if you extrapolate the amount of carbon per meter squared, it's about 60 kilograms. That's, that's a pretty large amount compared to sort of temperate soils, maybe about five times. Um, and then not surprisingly, when we, when we calculated our soil pools, we don't really see any difference over time. And that's standard dogma with soils. If you have a bunch of carbon, it's really hard to detect the change because the soil is spatially heterogeneous. And so our result was actually no different. And so I want you to kind of remember that pattern. So when we first plotted these data um, to our fixed depth of a meter, there's no change um, during the progression of the experiment. OK, but then if we step back and think about what was happening, so here's a picture of our um, experiment when we set it up. We have boardwalks to protect the tundra, and here's our flux chambers. I'm not showing that data today. Um, here we are back in 2009 when we set up the experiment. In 2015, um, it's a little hard to get the view, but the reason these look all sort of cattywampus is that the ground is subsiding, and so these boardwalks are all kind of getting out of alignment, and that's what I was talking to you that's compressing the soil. So if you imagine going out and sampling the soil, um, you can have your ambient tundra and your warming plot that's subsiding, and you go out and you collect your, your meter cores, or here it's showing a half a meter, and so you want to compare how much carbon is in the control versus your warming. And if you, if you look at that fixed depth here, which is how we s standardly do inventories, you can imagine that because of this compression, the surface that was here is now down here. So when you take that same 50 centimeter control uh, a core in your warming plot, you're actually getting some carbon down deeper that you weren't quantifying the first time around. So it's kind of an apples versus oranges comparison when you do this fixed depth inventory. Now, soil scientists know about this from, from peat soils, and there's a way to um, correct for it, and you can measure the ash content. You can take your soil carbon, put it in a muffled furnace, ash it, and what you get are the soil minerals. And so those soil minerals can serve as this metric for how much subsidence we have. So your depth might have changed through time because the ice is gone, but the soil minerals are essentially still there, and you can normalize your carbon against those soil minerals. So this plot is sort of the bottom line when you do that. If you don't use a fixed depth, we're not going to inventory carbon to fixed depth. You're going to, we're going to do it through time, um, or it's sort of for ash normalized. You can see there's a decreasing <coughs> trend. So in three out of the four years we sampled, the orange bar, the warming plot, is lower than the control. But the significant effect in the model is time. It's declining for both the warming and the control plots. And then if you look at the loss rate, it's it's projected at over a, a kilogram per year, so it's a fairly high rate of loss. And it's primarily in this mineral layer, so down sort of in the bottom of it is where we've lost the most of this carbon. Now, when I was first showing you the effect of the experiment, I showed you how the warming changed the active layer depth, but I wasn't show you, showing you the actual data, just the normalized data. So I'm going to show you a plot that shows the thaw depth. Now, it's, it's the real thaw depth of the warming, which is the orange, and the control, which is the black. And so an important thing to think about when we talk about control, we often think about the tundra that's unmanipulated. But this whole region is actually warming. So you can see there's a downward trend in our control plot. That's warming because of regional climate change. Our experiment is warming it further. So we're actually seeing loss of carbon both on the control side and on the warming side at this relatively high rate. Now, measuring soil carbon pools, so this is very different than if you've gone out and measured your top 10 centimeters or your top 50. If you use a fixed depth, you completely miss this, and that's an important point because that's mostly how we inventory soils. That's how we represent them in models as we don't have this changing soil depth. Now, another way to check this is ask about the carbon that's left behind, and we made measurements of the organic matter quality. So if you, if you were just looking at spatial variation, you'd sort of expect um, there to be no difference over time, but we measured uh, we use NMR to measure the organic matter quality. And again, I'm showing difference plots here. So if there are no differences, you'd see just this wiggle around the zero line. So this is showing you 2013 compared to 20, 2009. So really, these peaks that you see in the surface organic 
not so much in the deep organic, but in the mineral, really show you that the organic matter quality that's left five years later is different than when it started out. So that implies there's been this processing, and what's been left behind is the result of that. There's an imprint on the organic matter that's left. So it's not just a change in the quantity, but it's this quality that changes over time. Now, interestingly, um, the surface behaves as, as we expect. There's more, there's more fresh stuff that's been eaten up, and, and what's left behind is, is sort of the residual. But the deeper mineral actually shows the reverse pattern of this. So it, it, even though we see this imprint of changes, it's a little bit opposite of what we might have expected is this microbial decomposition of organic matter. So let me give my last slide here and just say that we measure direct loss if we do this um, ash normalization. And it's sort of a reminder to all of us is we're looking at these single snapshots of carbon, but what we really want to know is changes in the carbon pool. We're trying to detect it all with exchanges with the atmosphere, but we somehow forget that we might be able to actually directly measure changes in the soil carbon pool, which are what are giving us this feedback in the first place. So with that, I will end and um, turn it back over. Thank you. Again, as we are switching computers, if anyone has a quick question for Ted. Oh, wow, lots of questions. Yeah. I'll pick one of you. Okay, I have a question. Ladies first. Yeah. I have a question about the uh, subsidence. It's really interesting. So do you think that the subsidence can be masking the increased trend, the increased uh, uh, deepening of the active layer that we are not being able to, to, to properly account for? Yeah, Donut's asking a great question is, if, if I'm measuring active layer from the surface, how does subsidence affect that measurement? And in the CALM grid, the circumpolar active layer monitoring network um, knows well now that if you don't measure subsidence, that the active layer is not giving you a true metric of, of permafrost degradation. So uh, a shout out to my student, Heidi, who has a poster on Thursday on this topic from the experiment where she quantified with differential GPS the subsidence. And, and you can add that on top of the, the active layer measurement, and it almost doubles the amount of, of degradation that we ha would measure. So great question. Thank you. OK, so now moving on to the next speaker, which is Oliver Sonnentag. OK, good morning, everybody. I'd like to start off with some acknowledgments and yeah, I acknowledge the generous funding I've received over the years from several Canadian uh, federal and provincial funding agencies in Canada. And the work I'm going to present is part of the Wilfrid Laurie University Northwest Territories Partnership Agreement. And last but not least, I appreciate and acknowledge the continued support by two First Nations in the, in the Southern Northwest Territories, the Litliku First Nation and the Jean-Marie River First Nation. So boreal peatlands contribute about 20% to, global, uh, to global, uh, global wetland methane emissions and have been identified as one of the main controls on interannual variability in global atmospheric methane concentration. At the same time, boreal or global wetlands have, contributed, or have been identified as the largest source of uncertainty for as part of the global uh, methane budget. With increasingly warmer temperatures, especially with northern high latitudes warming twice the rate compared with the rest of the planet, it can be expected that boreal peatland methane emissions are going to increase, especially as a function of wetland extent, but also soil temperature. How all this plays out, or how all this is going to play out in relation to hydrologic conditions, warmer versus drier, remains unanswered at this point. If we look at northwestern Canada, or more specifically at the Tiger Plains ecozone, here in orange and its location within the extended above study domain here in red, we can see that the Tiger Plains ecozone or the boreal peatlands of the Tiger Plains ecozone are characterized by very high soil organic carbon content comparable only to the Hudson Bay lowlands and the north slope of Alaska. Pretty much all of the Tiger Plains ecozone contains permafrost. And if we look at the northern Tiger Plains ecozone here near Inuvik, roughly core, uh, aligned with the boreal forest tundra tree line. We have continuous permafrost, so it's relatively cold, it's relatively thick. And if we go further down, and continuous and extent, 
If we go further south, permafrost becomes discontinuous, it becomes sporadic, and, and finally isolated. And this is what I'm, the work I'm going to present here is looking at the southern uh, uh, Tiger Plains ecozone in the southern Northwest Territories at a very heterogeneous boreal forest wetland landscape. What does this look like in more detail? This is an image of the, yeah, of the, of the study region uh, taken from a helicopter. And in previous work, we showed that in, in this heterogeneous landscape, it's, uh, or in this heterogeneous landscape, increasingly warmer temperatures have caused widespread permafrost thaw, leading to substantial land cover changes. And a prominent example of these land cover changes is the expansion of wetlands at the expense of boreal forests. And in earlier work, we showed how Permafrost thaw induced wetland expansion caused an increase in landscape scale methane emissions, overall exerting a warming effect on the climate. Methane emission in this very fragmented landscape is mostly controlled by a water table position and its variation in space. Uh, in contrast, the uh, seasonality of, of or met uh, methane emissions is mostly controlled by soil temperature seasonality. So, in a warming climate, we can expect that. Uh, wetland soil temperatures are influ influenced by air temperature, but also by altered snowpack dynamics. And in the same time, uh, changing soil thermal regimes might stimulate veg wetland vegetation productivity, so provide leading to an increased uh, labile organic carbon supply for methanogenesis. So every year after or in spring after snow melt and once ground ice melted, the high thermal conductivity of these saturated wetland soils allow for rapid soil warming. And with an increase or with, an inc with increasingly warmer spring air temperatures, we can expect increasingly warmer soil, uh, wetland soil temperatures and as a result, increasing or increased methane emissions. And this was what drove the, or what initiated the research here. We were asking the question, how do warmer spring condition alter landscape methane emissions from a boreal peat landscape in the sporadic permafrost zone of Northwest Canada. So more specifically, we're looking at Scotty Creek, which is a 152 square kilometer catchment in the sporadic permafrost zone of the southern uh, Tiger Plains ecozone, around 50% are mineral uplands, the other half peatlands and lakes. And our focus was on the headwater portion of this watershed or this catchment. And the headwater is dominated by forested permafrost plate plateaus and permafrost-free wetlands. And here, a view from an Edicoverance Tower. So the presence of boreal forest is an indicator for permafrost, whereas as here, we have uh, permafrost-free wetlands uh, collapse features. And over time, we notified and observed uh, the thawing permafrost caused an expansion of wetland at the expense of these forests. To address our question, we analyzed four years of nested Edicoverance measurements installed on a, on a forested permafrost peat plateau. And here we have the, the footprint climatology of what we refer to as landscape tower. It's a 50 meter tall tower. And the footprint is dominated by a very fragmented landscape comprising forested peat plateaus here in green and permafrost free wetlands. And nested <coughs> within the footprint, we have a shorter tower structure measuring, also measuring the same uh, fluxes, CO2, methane, latent heat, and sensible heat supported by several uh, ancillary measurements and also digital repeat photography. And to, put, to provide a regional climatological context, we analyzed long-term meteorological measurements from the nearby airport in Fort Simpson. So what are the climate conditions? So we asked, what is the new normal? If we compare air temperatures or growing season air temperatures from the mid-50s to growing season air temperatures from the early 2000s, uh, we know, or we identified a significant increase in growing season air temperatures over, over the 60, 70 years. If we look at precipitation, it has increased as well, also significantly. And in comparison to our four years uh, of study between 2013 and 2016, growing season air temperatures were again significantly warmer than, than normal. However, if we look at spring temperature defined as mean annual temperatures over May, we see that we had three relatively warm years, 2013, 15, and 16, but one spring was, was cooler, 
but at the same time representing normal conditions uh, between, uh, between 1980-10 and 2010. So we are looking at three warmer years, or three, excuse me, three warmer spring and one cooler spring representing normal conditions. However, if we compare this to or look at precipitation input, there was no change in precipitation between these years, between May and June, uh, July, August, and correspondingly, there was not a lot of variation looking at water table dynamics. So water table dynamics varied between 10 and 20 centimeters every year, and then starting July, August, we saw quite a substantial variation in precipitation, so summer rainfall, summer storms in terms of frequency and intensity, resulting in the largest variation in water, water table dynamics in the, the collapse scar bog. So what does this mean for soil temperature? Uh, we can see here over under a snow cover, soil temperature around minus, 22, uh, uh, minus 32 centimeters below the wetland surface, stayed around zero degrees under snow cover. <coughs> then after snow melt, and once the ground ice was melted, uh, soil temperature started to increase rapidly for three years, 2013, 15, and 16. However, in the cooler year, uh, soil temperature minus 32 degrees in the wetlands stayed uh, around zero for much, much longer before it started to increase. And then around mid-growing season so and late-growing season, soil temperatures were pretty much the same for, uh, for these four years. Now looking at methane emission at the landscape scale, so from the, our taller tower, we can see that, yeah, the mean, oops, we can see that a higher and an earlier peak in these landscape methane emissions were reached in years with a warmer spring compared to the year with the cooler, or more accurately, I should say, in the uh, spring with normal conditions. And in the end, this played out in a 20, 20 to 25 increase in growing season and annual methane emission in the warmer years compared to the cooler year. So if we look at uh, the controls, we ident or we noticed a uh, Yes, it's obviously quite obvious, a st statistically significant correlation between, a relationship between mean soil temperature at minus th 32 centimeter below the wetland surface and mean monthly methane emissions over the, our study period. However, if we look at water table position in the wetland, there was no relationship at all, pretty much. Similar to or what I, noted, what I mentioned earlier, the reduction in methane emission in the cooler year, if we look at vegetation productivity, and here we use uh, gross primary productivity derived from, net, from uh, net ecosystem exchange measurements from our collapse scar bog, as we can see here in the photo, and also vegetation greenness as derived from a growing archive of digital uh, photographs here in the, the lines. <coughs> Due to instrument failure, we had to stitch together and one representative here. But here we can see the dots representing uh, net, uh, gross primary productivity, and here the lines, a combined representative uh, vegetation greenness time series. We can see that in the cooler year, vegetation productivity was reduced compared to the warmer years, where much higher uptake was noticed. And this we interpret okay. We had in warmer spring years, vegetation productivity was stimulated and thus also increasing the, the supply of labile organic carbon for methanogenesis and compared to the cooler year. And it's also when we look at two representative images here, here we have a cool spring and very brownish colors and then here the uh, re representative photo from uh, one of the warmer springs and the vegetation is just more in abundance and way more active. So to summarize this, uh, warmer spring air temperatures cause earlier wetland soil warming in the spring, and overall warmer wetland spring soil temperatures increase growing season and also annual methane emissions by around 20 to 25 percent <coughs> along the southern limit of permafrost in the Tiger Plains ecozone of northwestern Canada. And I'd like to mention that I have two other oral presentations on similar topics, also Scotty Creek. So these methane emissions, we combine them with the lateral, uh, with dissolved organic carbon export towards the complete carbon budget of this rapidly thawing landscape on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, I have another oral presentation going into more detail regarding the hydrology and the runoff regimes at this vulnerable, of this vulnerable landscape. And that's about it. <laughs>
Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Okay, well, uh, thank you. we get the back on time. Yes, that's true. And our next speaker is actually going to take us to Subarctic European Russian Tundra. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here today. I will talk about the interannual variability of the full greenhouse gas bars in subarctic tundra, also including nitrous oxide. That is still re very rarely measured in the Arctic, but um, it has been shown during this recent decade that this gas is important in many permafrost peatland sites, including our study site. Our study site, SEDA, is located in subarctic tundra with discontinuous permafrost. And it is the only long-term research facility that we have in European Russian tundra. It's also located in a very interesting zone where warm permafrost coincides with very huge soil organic carbon stocks. And also it's close to tree line, so um, we can expect um, tree line advanced tropification permafrost store in rather near future. Uh, this SEDA study site as subarctic tundra in general is a mosaic of different land cover types where there can be very strong differences in greenhouse gas exchange and vegetation and soil type at very short distances. And these different land cover types in Seda can be divided roughly into four groups. We have the a tundra heath with mineral soils with shrub vegetation covering large, largest part of the landscape. But then very characteristic for our study site are the waste peat plateaus where permafrost accreditation took place about 2000 years ago and caused uplifting of the peatland surface that is now Omprotrophic and well-trained because of this uplifting. A small but still significant part of this uplifted peatland surface is unvegetated. There are these unvegetated patches that occur across the Pan-Arctic, also in other permafrost peatlands. And although they, their coverage is small, they are very interesting because they are greenhouse gas hotspots, greenhouse gas release hotspots in the landscape. And then we have wetlands, waterlocked, fence and willow stands that cover about 16% of the landscape. Then uh, we have measured greenhouse gas exchange of all these three gases at all these dominant surfaces from year 2007. And in our previous studies, we have observed that the spatial heterogeneity in the greenhouse gas exchange is very large with respect to all these three gases. This, these are the data from a single year of measurements from 2007 to 2008. And you can see the tundra heat surfaces that are neutral with respect to methane and nitrous oxide, and also their carbon balance is rather close to zero. Then we have the dry peatlands. If they are vegetated, these peat plateau surfaces, they are carbon sinks, and they don't release significant amounts of methane or nitrous oxide. But then these bare surfaces, they release a lot of carbon dioxide, small amounts of methane, but then they have these high nitrous oxide emissions that are comparable to emissions from Arctic or tropical soils. And then wetlands are high carbon sinks and high sources of methane. Then if we look at the long-term climate trends in Sela, we notice that during 50 past years, there has been an increase of mean annual temperature for about three degrees and at the same time the precipitation has increased 
about 90 millimeters per year, and this increase in the precipitation is mostly taking place in, in autumn time. This red box indicates the period of the study in my presentation today. So you can notice that there is, was a considerable variability with respect to temperature and precipitation both. So we are dealing with very different years. And uh, in my talk, I will now look at the very basic environmental parameters, such as temperature, precipitation, and thaw depth as the primary controls for this uh, greenhouse gas exchange. And this is an ongoing work in progress. So I'm very glad to hear your suggestions and comments after my talk during the break. So, um, and then hypothesis for my presentation today, I have been formulating based on our knowledge about the seasonal variability in greenhouse gas exchange, plus also the results of a warming experiment that we have been conducting at the site with the help of open top chambers from 2012. Then first about carbon dioxide. We have observed in our study site that uh, increased temperatures do not always lead to higher growth of plants, so not always higher cross photosynthesis is observed with warming. Even reduction has been observed at the peat plateau sites. And that's why uh, we, I hypothesized that during very warm years there could be water stress or temperature stress that is limiting the growth. So we wouldn't observe this positive temperature relationship, but rather a positive relationship with precipitation. And since autotrophic respiration is the last part of ecosystem respiration, I was also expecting that it doesn't necessarily increase with warmer temperatures, but there would be also this positive trend with precipitation. Um, really, the temperature dependence of cross photosynthesis wasn't there. It wasn't positive and it wasn't any clear trend. There was a precipitation trend, but it was to the other direction that I expected. Uh, ecosystem respiration increased with temperature only at these unvegetated spots on peatlands, but not on the vegetated surfaces, where the ecosystem respiration, uh, it was decreased with precipitation. So I have to re reject the hypothesis that everything would be promoted and increased during wetter years, but then um, I still have to look at the data more deeply to understand really uh, what causes the interannual variability in the carbon dioxide emissions. Then, uh, the wetlands are the only significant methane sources in this landscape. So my uh, methane talk is focused on them. In these wetlands, we have a floating peatland surface that adjusts to the variability in the water table throughout the growing season. And that's why we have permanently high water tables so temperature is the primary control for the methane emissions during the growing season. So I also assumed that this would be true for the interannual variability as well. So also between drier and wetter years, the peatland surface would fluctuate uh, with the water table and it would be temperature dependent. But no, there was no positive dependence of the emissions with temperature. But there was, again, a good correlation with precipitation during the summer and the preceding winter, and, and, um, which is an indicator of the water that is coming to the systems from so snow melt. So although water table variations are important for seasonal variability, they play an important role for interannual variability. And then let's talk a bit about these nitrous, nitrous oxide emissions from bare beat surfaces. We have looked at the mechanisms behind the nitrous oxide emissions at these sites, and we have uh, noticed that there are both nitrification and denitrification, and also nitrifier and denitrification are important, but denitrification seems to be the dominant process. It's an anaerobic process, but it's dependent on a nitrogen nitrate that uh, is produced in aerobic nitrification. So for high N2 emissions to take place in these peat soils, we need an intermediate moisture content 
not to low moisture, that there would be anaerobic microsites for denitrification, but at the same time, it cannot be too moist because then nitrification wouldn't take place. In our previous data, we have found very strong correlation between nitrous oxide emissions and temperature during the very wet and warm year 2007, where temperature was almost a single control for nitrous oxide emissions. However, there might be drier years when this is not true. So we hypothesized that temperature is controlling the nitrous oxide emissions unless moisture is limiting. And that's really what we observed. There were poor correlations with air temperature and soil, soil moisture alone. But then if we look at thaw depth and nitrous oxide emissions, we notice that it's correlating rather nicely positively. And thaw depth is um, some kind of indicator of both temperature and moisture, because in moist peat, the heat conductivity is better. So uh, deeper thaw is associated, associated with wetter soils. Let's compare the spatial versus interannual variability at the site. It was very evident for all the gases and, and all the components of CO2 flux that the variability between years, although it's large, several hundreds of percent, is still much smaller for every, every flux component compared to this spatial variability in the system. And this suggests that at least in our study site and probably in many other subarctic sites too, it is more important even to catch the spatial variability. So to measure different surfaces and to use high resolution land cover classifications than to um, collect long time series or to have this long term data. Although of course if you can have both then go ahead. But in these remote sites, that might be difficult. My take home messages, three of them. First of all, precipitation was a stronger control for greenhouse gas fluxes than temperature at our study site. Secondly, the spatial variability in greenhouse gas fluxes was much larger than the interannual variability. And my third message is that I encourage you to include nitrous oxide in your greenhouse gas monitoring campaigns in the Arctic. It doesn't occur everywhere, but it could occur at sites where you have permafrost peatlands, where you have soils with high soil organic matter content and high soil organic nitrogen. And it can also occur at sites where vegetation growth is disturbed, like thermocarst sites or bare soils, or um, sites where there are pest outbreaks or frost spells or anything that disturbs the vegetation. Because in these kind of situations, the soil nitrogen <coughs> that is mineralized is full, fully available for soil microbes when the vegetation uptake is hampered. I want to thank my co-authors in Finland and Russia, the field teams over the years, and the funding agencies. Thank you for your attention. Questions for our speaker? I have a question. So, what, um, what causes those bare, unvegetated peat patches? Okay, uh, these unvegetated peat patches, they are caused by wind erosion. That's the most important reason. So, they are on the top of the peat plateau where there is just a little snow in the winter time. But then, a minor role. Uh, have the frost action like cryoturbation in the top surface layer that is keeping the vegetation out once it has been established. Yes. Yes, we do. We, we uh, observe it at our fan sites very regularly. And that is a common feature of wet wetlands. So there is denitrification, but since it's uh, uh, redox uh, conditions are like, it's waterlogged, it's anaerobic, that's why they are taking up the atmospheric N2 and reducing it to N2. Yeah. 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 Ye
And our next speaker is Colm Sweeney, who will be talking about the state of the Arctic carbon cycle from an atmospheric perspective. So I'm sure that will answer all your questions. Uh, thank you, everyone. For This has been a great session. I've, um, I'm learning a lot about uh, things. And I think there's been a lot of interesting uh, debates that have already sort of occurred between talks. Um, some say that uh, greenhouse gases are not increasing uh, with, with water, and some are saying that they are. We're seeing massive losses in um, uh, carbon pools in the soil. Um, the atmosphere is a great way of looking at what is happening to the greenhouse gases. Um, but the challenge is always that you need to find, uh, you need to be confident that your background, you need to separate the area and the region that you're looking at from all the transport and other things that happen in the atmosphere. So I'm going to uh, take a stab at sort of looking at where we are. I'm going to, um, uh, and I want to thank all the people who have helped me. In particular, at the end of this talk, I'm going to try to um, quickly go through some of the results that we saw this summer um, in our campaign uh, around Alaska and part of Canada. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, start first with um, not all of you were present for the first talk of the morning, uh, um, tisk tisk, but Roshin gave a very nice uh, presentation on work that we were doing um, looking at the Barrow Station and looking at the, um, one, the massive increases in temperature, but also looking at the fact that we saw um, really large increases in the enhancement above the background. So when we look at winds coming from the northeast, we see a background uh, signal. And when we see this, uh, this southerly winds bring in enhancements of both methane and, and CO2 in the later part of this, uh, the summer and early winter. Um, and so for methane, we see very little increases uh, over that long 30-year period. And CO2, we see some significant increases. Um, this is another look at uh, what uh, Roshin went into detail on, which was looking at the seasonal cycle. On the left is a um, picture of the seasonal cycle uh, in the, um, for methane. And on the right is the seasonal cycle for CO2. We can see previous to 1999 in blue and, and after uh, 2006 in red. And what you see is a significant increase at the latter part of the year uh, if you look at the total annual cycle. Um, and that's right in here. Um, one of the things that neither Roshin or I were able to tease out was what was happening uh, to the drawdown in CO2 in the uh, summertime. Two reasons for that. One, there's a real uh, a small amount of uh, measurements. Uh, the wind just doesn't blow from the uh, south very often in, at Barrow, so we don't get to see the events when when carbon is actually being taken up by the tundra area. Um, and so the other thing is that during those months, we expect the boundary layer to be quite high. So the signal that we're actually seeing is quite small, and so uh, in uh, because it's diluted by the, the larger boundary layer. Um, so what I uh, wanted to do is step back one step and, and go back to where uh, we came from when we originally started the, uh, to look at this, which is looking at the background, the clean air sector, and what that is telling us about the whole Arctic and try to derive um, some information from that. Um, and this is what I've plotted here is the land sector, which is the southern, when the winds are blowing from the southerly wind, and then uh, the background, which is that clean air sector. And the difference between those is what we really focused on, those earlier studies. Um, what we can see, though, when we look at the background is the obvious things that people have been writing. It was, uh, we've been writing, uh, there's a lot of papers in the last 20 years that have uh, been written about the fact that the amplitude of the seasonal cycle of CO2 has increased dramatically uh, just at the Barrow site since the 1976 uh, time period. We've seen a 25% increase in that amplitude. 
Um, we also see uh, an earlier drawdown, so the minimum happens earlier on. And the combination is that when you have these two things, you end up with the rate of uptake of CO2 in the atmosphere is, is a lot greater. Um, and, and so a lot of people have speculated that with the increase in temperature, you have early snow melt. Um, that increases your, uh, the length of the growing season. And voila, you have an increase in uptake. Um, and presumably, that's NEE, although I'm, I'm still not ready to say that yet. Um, there was a really nice study earlier this year published which showed that in the first half of the Barrow record, when we're looking at this background, we see a really nice correlation with temperature. Uh, this is surface temperature, not soil temperature. But what we see is that there's a really nice um, correlation. And then it disappears. Um, and so they suggest that maybe the um, growing season is, is getting longer to the point where um, light's limiting it, or uh, that there is not enough chilling. So reduced chilling is, is, is also causing that decorrelation. So as a, um, I wanted to step back yet again, find another background. I'm looking to the southern hemisphere for a background. So this is uh, methane. This is the interhemispheric gradient. But what you can do, and Ed, my, a colleague of mine at NOAA has been doing for years, is looking at this, inter, what he calls the interpolar difference. Um, and this is methane. And what you can see is he draws two lines through this set of data. Uh, some of us might draw one line and see a decrease. He draws two lines, and he sees no decrease. Um, now, he blames that break in, in uh, a problem in the Soviet Union in 1992, um, and which, re which caused a change in, in uh, fossil fuel exploration and decreased emissions of methane by 10 uh, teragrams. Um, a note that the Arctic has about uh, 20 teragrams right now of methane, so that's a big change. But anyways, um, the point is that um, after that point, he does not see any change and infers that uh, any changes in methane that we see in the atmosphere are not from anything that's happening in the Arctic. Um, if we do this with CO2, we get a very strong increase in CO2 in, CO2 in the uh, interpolar difference. Um, but let's not, uh, you know, and so again, coming back to what my goal is here, I'm trying to figure out, is NEE, I need an integral. I need a large scale integral. The nice thing about the interpolar difference is it's a, it basically air has to travel about one year to get there. So you're setting up a nice, you have a nice background and you can start to see changes. Um, but this is a big change. Um, and I want to see if we're, you know, we've, we've observed, as I said before, in the regional areas, we've in, observed an increase in methane, I'm oh, sorry, of CO2 emissions in the winter time. Um, is this mean that NE is, is decreasing or does it mean that it's actually, that there's a balance, that GPP is actually um, uh, taking up the slack and the turnover rates are changing? Um, the problem is, is the carbon budget is a little more um, complicated than the methane budget. And the big, uh, the big elephant in the room is fossil fuels. So what I've done is plotted versus uh, latitude. And you, I've put lines. Uh, these lines here are my where. So I'm, I'm taking all the sites south of this line and subtracting that from all the sites south of this, uh, north of this line. And this is my interhemisphere gradient that I typically get for CO2. Um, and then these are my fluxes. This is the fossil fuel flux. And this <coughs> is that flux that I'm trying to tease out to see if that cha has changed at all. Um, but the problem is this. Um, what we see is a huge fossil fuel uh, sink. So what I've done now is look at the trend um, in the time period that we have run Carbon Tracker. 
uh, CO2, which is an assimilation model which actually ingests all of uh, the information that we know about fossil fuel emissions, but it also ingests all the information from all the sites to derive uh, uh, biospheric emissions. And when I do that, I can, it allows me to, it has tracers for all these different uh, emission sources. And so when I look at the CO2 emissions, oh, and by the way, the, uh, the gradient that I've got over this 14-year uh, time period is about 0.1 ppm per year. Um, and so if I look at a similar tracer over the same interhemispheric gradient uh, for CO2 in Carbon Tracker, I get 0.11 ppm, which is similar to what we're seeing. But what we see is that most of that gradient is caused by the fossil fuel. Um, and it's the exponential rise in the fossil fuel in the mid-latitudes that get transported into the high latitudes before they come down to the southern latitudes. And that gives me a nice increase. So I can, there's a couple of conclusions I can um, come from this. One is that um, we just, the, the, the uncertainty of the transport and our ability to do fossil fuel emissions is too great. Or I could say NE is zero, and therefore GPP is, is smoking in the, uh, in the, uh, the, in, in the Arctic. Um, I'll, I'll uh, go with the former. Um, quickly, a quick review of what we did for above this summer, which is an uh, opportunity um, to really understand some of the processes that are happening in more detail because really we do want to come back to a model like Carbon Tracker and what it needs is a better estimate of uh, better prior for the primary, primary productivity and respiration in, the, in, the, uh, in these regions. And if we could do that, we could get better estimates of what's actually the, the net changes that are happening over that large region. So what we did was... We went uh, and took advantage of the fact that we get really large um, uh, footprints of, of what we're doing with, uh, with, of the Arctic when we do profiles. And so we, our main goal was to do profiles in as many different places as we could. One of the great um, uh, opportunities was to get over to Canada um, to uh, sample some of the areas that Oliver talked about in his talk. Um, and so we managed to get 25 profiles in during six different campaigns that lasted from April into this last November. So we finished November 6th of this year. Um, and you can see the, the sort of general uh, extent of, of what we did. We flew about 320 um, uh, hours and um, something like... Uh, I'd say 30,000 miles. Um, this is uh, all of the profiles, um, and I decided that this would keep it short as just to put them all as one color so that you wouldn't get, uh, I wouldn't get dragged too far into this. But what these different um, columns show, is, whoops, is um, the different columns show the Methane here, CO2 here, and CO. And what you can see is that in July we had really high uh, fires, and so you can see the high CO. July is also a time when we saw really high methane emissions in the, in the surface, as well as a drawdown in CO2. But by the by end of October, snow was on the ground. We we're still seeing massive emissions of CO2 and methane, um, as we've seen um, from Roshin's talk. So there's uh, lots of work to be done to analyze these results. Um, we want to combine these with a lot of other aircraft campaigns that have been happening over the last eight or nine years and um, combine these into a flux analysis and hopefully with that train our models to do better at these large scales. Um, so I will conclude and, um, and answer any questions. Any questions for Colin? Okay, everyone seems ready for coffee. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, there is one question. Have you gotten any of this data back to the Alaska Native communities? Say again? 
I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, no, we have not. Um, we're just, sorry, we have not done that. Um, we, just, we just finished uh, getting all the data together, so. But you can say all the data will be public. All the data is actually going to be available very soon. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank all our speakers again. <laughs> and we'll reconvene here at 1020 for the next part of this. <laughs>